Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Foundry Church YouTube channel. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, make sure you guys do that right now. That way you can stay up to date with all the content that we show through this channel. And also we have an Apple podcast as well. So if you wanna hear the audio version of what you're about to see here, make sure you go and check that out today too. If you wanna know more that's happening kind of during the week here at the Foundry Church, we post a lot of things on Facebook. So make sure you like us on Facebook as well. With that being said, let's continue our series. Listen. Well, we begin this new series called Listen, and as we dive into this, we get to deal with some topics that maybe are a little bit unfamiliar in, in our context, and I speak specifically of a West Michigan context. It's not universally unfamiliar, but I would say in the Reformed context, it may feel a little bit unfamiliar. So what we're going to do is we're going to listen over the next number of weeks. We're gonna tune our ears and we're really gonna listen to some things God has said and hopefully it allows us to start learning to listen to things God is still saying. So tonight, uh, or today, what I would like to do is ask you the question, have you ever had somebody ask you, what's the matter? What's the matter? Like you have something go on. Um, Maybe you have like, You walk into a room, and there's a kid flopping around on the floor, wailing and crying. You don't look and go, stop, what do you do? You go, what's the matter? What's the matter? You start asking them questions. What's the matter? When we ask that question, we're we're betraying that there's something out of the ordinary taking place. And when I walk into a situation and I ask, what's the matter? What's going on? I'm asking more than what happened. It is, it is a moment where I am saying, tell me everything, start to finish. Let me know not only what's going on right now, but what got you there and what can get you beyond this moment. It is to asking me, me asking, how do, I, how do I know where you're at and how do I help you through it? What's the matter? I can tell you this, that I am not a good reader of people. Some of you would be like, that's very true. But there is one person I think I read pretty well. It's my bride. Oh, man, I can walk into a room, and if Erica has a look on her face, I'm like, what happened? What, what's going on? What happened? What's the matter? When I ask her what's the matter, when I see her, I wouldn't be satisfied if she's like, I'm sad. I'd be like, awesome. That's good enough for me. No, no, I wouldn't be okay with I'm just sad. I would want to know so much more than that. I would want to know what happened before you were hurt. What what were you doing before you got injured or what was going on? How did something injure you? Where does it it hurt? How many times? How many times as a parent, maybe you've asked, where does it hurt because the kid's just flailing? Where does it hurt? Tell me what's going on. You want an all-encompassing viewpoint. You want to see it and you want to see the whole matter at hand. Maybe you've seen someone who's hurt themselves and they're writhing in pain and they can't put into words what's going on. They're pointing. I remember working in construction. There was a guy who smashed his finger with a 28-ounce Vaughn waffle-faced framing hammer and it bonked on his thumb and made the worst sound you've ever heard and it turned his little thumb into a beaver tail. Just flattened it right out. And he was like, oh. And he's making these on, and we're like, what's going on? Oh, look at his thumb. It could build a dam. Like, it was horrible. You look at me, you wonder, what's the matter, right? We want to know what the issue is. Well, so it is with God. He wants us to know what the issue is. Join me and listen. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, The word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, and through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said. I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. 
Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. Jeremiah 1.9 says, The Lord reached out, put his hand on my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. He spoke, God spoke these words into the young prophet's life and he said this to him and it tells us something that we can hold on to that is a truth both then right up till now. Prophecy is when God puts the words there. It is not, prophecy is not good preaching or teaching. It is not good counsel or even a good Bible study. Prophecy is when God has something specific to say and uses someone to speak it out, to speak it into reality. And you go back to the creation narrative and you remember that God may still be speaking creative new things. God has someone speak it out. We'll talk more specifically about this in the weeks to come. But it's important for you and I to grab onto and understand what prophecy is. It's when God has something specific to say, and it can be an urgent word. It can be a word of caution. It can be many different things, and we'll look at it. But the reality is it's when God puts the words into the mouth of a person and they speak out obediently. Isaiah 51, 16, I have put... My words in your mouth, said the Lord to the prophet Isaiah. In Second Chronicles, we see that it says this. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again. See what it's saying? God put his message into their mouth because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words. They despised the words that God had put into the mouths of the prophets, so they even despised the prophets. And it says this, The Lord said to me, What they say is good, and I will raise up for them a prophet um, like you from among their fellow Israelites. And this is out of Deuteronomy. I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account Anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophets speak in my name. God's saying something very important to us and to that original context that he does put his words at times into the mouth of a human being and has them declare a specific and an urgent task on behalf of God. So when we talk about God's words, what we have to do is understand that in this it says, I have put my words in your mouth, he says to Jeremiah. There's something about that that goes on within the Hebrew that is very important, and it's this, the matter. The matter, that what's the matter, right? This, this idea is, well, the matter is exactly what my words can be translated as in Hebrew. God is speaking about the matter at hand, about the matter, the situation, whatever's going on. God is speaking about the matter. His words speak to the matter, what matters. The very thing that's closest to, to the heart of God, that's what he's speaking on. God's speaking on the matter. He's telling us what's the matter, what's the remedy to the matter, and these different things. When God reveals this, we understand that when he says, I'm putting my words into you, he says, I'm putting the matter that's closest to my heart into your mouth. Now declare it for me. And it makes it far more significant because the matter that God speaks of is what matters to God. And if it matters to God, you and I as Christ followers must come close to what matters to the heart of God. What matters to God is the only thing that truly actually matters he is God. Therefore, what matters to him should matter to you and I. The purpose, the plan, the who, the where, the what, the how, the why, everything, the matter at hand should be our listening to what God's matter, what God wants to say, tuning our ears. But what has our culture done so well? It's plugged things into our ears and got the noise going loud enough that we never attend to the matter at hand. So just just a quick note, we will be stu studying and looking at prophecy for a little while, and we need to remember, and this is super like 
if there is one laser tight reality that is important in this, it's this. Jesus Christ is the word, right? We know this. John 1, the word made flesh. Jesus Christ, the word incarnate, the first word of creation, the word. Jesus Christ is the word that's been put into our mouth, the gospel. Jesus Christ is the matter at hand. He always was and he always will be. Jesus Christ is the matter that's closest to the heart of God. It is what God promised in prophecy. If you look at the messianic promises, the 300 plus messianic prophecies, God had his prophets talking about the Messiah, the Christ, the word, the matter that was closest to God's heart. And what was the work of Jesus Christ? It was salvation. It was reuniting you and I or God and myself, God and you, into a relationship, reconnecting us. That was the matter at hand. And according to the last words of Jesus Christ, the matter on our hearts is taking this gospel outwards and sharing it with the world and discipling them and training them up. Jesus is the word. In the end, Jesus is the matter at hand. Jesus always will be. All prophecy leads to and glorifies Jesus Christ. All prophecy points to him. Everything in the universe points back to the word made flesh. Everything points to him and everything emanates or proceeds out of him. Jesus Christ is the matter. It's why when we abuse the name of Jesus, it's so like deafening to our spirits. It just shatters them because Jesus' name, that word, that name has power. We sang it a minute ago, what a beautiful name it is. It's a beautiful thing because it is the center. It is the matter at hand that we, the church, must deal with. Everything points to him and everything emanates out of him. He is the center. But he's given us a human speaker. In the prophet Jeremiah, we see that we have human mouthpieces. God speaking to human beings and them speaking the matter at hand. And Jeremiah was young. And that didn't matter, (laughs) ironically, right? Jeremiah says, look, I'm young. I'm too young for this, and it didn't matter to God. What matters to God isn't the package the prophet comes in. It's courageous obedience to speak the word of God and what matters to God, speaking it out to the people. God has the words. The prophets are simply the vessels. They're simply the vessels, and we begin to see the heart of prophecy there. Prophecy allows people to speak the heart of God into certain situations, and they have to do so boldly. Knowledge isn't part of it. Jeremiah was young. He would have known that at his age in a Jewish context, he would have been seen as someone who should sit, well, he should be seen and not heard in most public discourse as a young man. Why? Because it was gray hair, which I'm growing in daily, um, is the crown of wisdom in that culture. And the gray hair you have allows you to speak out of the font of wisdom of years you speak. And God's saying, no, knowledge isn't always it. Experience isn't always it. Education isn't always it. Courageous obedience is it. If God speaks into your life, will you speak it out in obedience? And Jeremiah tested true on that. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call to me, God's speaking to him, and I will answer you and tell you the great unsearchable things that you cannot know. It tells us this. That if we are to be priest and prophet to one another in this life, that God can reveal mysteries to us that are beyond the horizon that we can't know. Not because we're superstitious or magical, but because he's God. And if he wants to speak something that pertains to the matter at hand, the glory of Jesus Christ and that being revealed to the world around us, he can do so through you and I powerfully. And he does so in the life of Jeremiah. He does so in the life of Jeremiah. So it tells me this, there is no excuse. There is no excuse not to listen and live in the tension of courageous obedience. Whether you like the messenger or the message of God doesn't really matter because God promised 
to speak through the prophets. Remember what it said in Deuteronomy. I will speak through them, through my prophet. He, he promises to speak. And he spoke to us again and again and again. Like in the life of Jeremiah, he is known as the weeping prophet. He wrote the book of Lamentations to lament because Jeremiah from about, oh, I think it was around 620, 625 B.C., until 586, the great Babylonian um, triumph over the city of Jerusalem, when Jerusalem fell historically to the Babylonian Empire. And they came in and they tore the temple apart and they decimated the gates and the walls of all Jerusalem. Jeremiah was the prophet in that time. Jeremiah had prophesied. He spoke to the people He's like, look, your sin is not okay before the eyes of God, and he is going to wipe this city off the map. But don't worry, in 70 years, he's going to return us, a remnant back to us, and he's going to rebuild everything. But your sin must be dealt with. He was a prophet who wept over the people, and he saw the anguish and the heartache of a city besieged, of a city sacked and destroyed, its nobles led into captivity. He saw those things. Even though he was a little reluctant, he was obedient. He was obedient. Even though his heart broke over what he was saying, he was obedient. I love that he's the weeping prophet. He's not sitting there going, doom on you. Man, you guys are in trouble. He's saying, we are in trouble. He owned it for himself. He owned it with them. He loved them. He didn't want them in trouble. He called them back to God because that was the message. So here's what we know from Scripture and why we have no excuse not to tune our ears is because God gave the prophets the message. He told them what the matter at hand was, and he gave them his words. We have them in the canon of Scripture. God did it out of love, patience, and compassion, and even pity. Look at that scripture we read in Chronicles. When we look at that and it said, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and his dwelling place where his spirit dwelt in the temple. God had pity on it. In the Christian age, we know that the spirit fills us. And there are times where I believe God has pity on us in our circumstances and because of the temple. God is gracious, and he is loving and patient and compassionate. He gave them chance after chance. He gave them all kinds of opportunities. And it was still God's message, even though the people of God didn't always like to hear it. Think of how many times they turned on Moses, on Elijah, on Jeremiah. We'll look at other prophets, and what we'll see is that they don't always like the messenger or the message. It doesn't change that that's the matter close to the heart of God right now. We have to tune our ear and quit making excuses for for why this word may not be for us. When it's painful, when it digs deep and it convicts us of sin, when it calls us out of certain behaviors and into obedience and courage to trust that God will see us through it. So here's what we have to do. We have to learn to seek God's words on the matters at hand. I can't imagine how many matters at hand are going on in your life right now. How many things in your life where you could, you know, I'd look in and say, what's the matter here, right? You could look into my life and say, what's the matter? There's things going on in our lives where we look and we see and we know that something's not quite right. We may not be writhing in pain, but we're not sitting in placid joy either. And you would say, what's the matter? There's a lot going on in our day-to-day lives. There's a lot of restlessness. And we need to learn to seek God, not making excuses, but seek God's words on the matter at hand in our life. When we face problems that we can't articulate, I mean, anybody else amen to that? Has anybody else ever had that where you have a problem and you're like, ah, I don't even know what to say. I just need help. I can't even, I can't form words for it. When we don't know which way to go or what decision to make, when one thing seems too good to be true and the other road just seems, uh, and you're like, well, I know this is safe, but I, I don't know which way you're calling me, God. 
to learn to seek God at the matter at hand. When we can't explain what the matter is, we can ask God, what matters to you right now? I think that's a critical question for the church to begin to ask. What, what matters to you? God, what, what's on your heart right now? And listen to him. Sometimes, in our groanings, in our tears, in our joy, and our inexpressible like delight with life, we make the sounds out of our own being that only God's spirit can interpret. Some of us have been given the gift of tongues. Some of us speak in tongues, and that's awesome. I'm a charismatic who never got a prayer language, which is kind of lame. I'm a little bitter, but we'll deal with that later in a counseling session. But I never got to speak in tongues. But I do know people who have a prayer language, and it's awesome. I'm like, that's great. But I do know this, that there are some times where I can't articulate the, the pain I'm going through, the hurt I'm feeling, the scared feeling, the fear, the, the shame, the things that are speaking into my life, and out of me comes a groan. Have you ever had that where you're just like, oh, God, please. And you start making noises. Have you ever, I mean, I feel like I'm talking a bit to a wall on this one, but anybody? Yeah, where you're just sitting there and you feel like you're getting a fax. You're just like, oh, right? And then paper comes out of you because you're like, oh, I got a fax. That's awesome. Yeah, well, I'm in trouble. Like, that's how it feels. There are groanings and sounds that come out of us that it says the Spirit of God interprets. It knows our groanings. The Spirit knows what we're saying even when we can't form it with our own words. There are literal groans and gasps, giggles, and I I have one child, and Erica and I have talked about it. We can hear him smile. It's the craziest thing. He has a smile that's so wonderfully his that when he does it, it's like it squeaks. It's the greatest thing. It's a sound. It doesn't, but I can hear it, and I look over, and I'm like, yep, there it is. There's that grin. I know that. It's a... Here's what I think we get to do in those moments where we're, we're grinding through something. We're grinding through it and we don't know the words for it. What we get to do in those literal groans and gasps and sounds that I have offered up and I know you have too. Here's what we get to do. In our wordless efforts, we are pleading with God. We are making a plea to him to give us clarity on what matters from his perspective, not ours. Because if we could see it from God's perspective, we'd have peace. The lack of peace comes from our perspective. We see all the things that can go wrong. God sees it as his will. And he knows what will come to pass if we could see it from his perspective. So those groans, those gasps, those, those sometimes even giggles, those joys, those moments where we're laying it out and seeking God's word on the matter at hand are very important because they can give us clarity on the matter at hand from God's perspective and get us out of our own perspective. What are his words? What are his words then? Through the prophets, scripture, I would say we can look there. The counsel of God in the Bible, the Bible itself. That's where we can look. We can find his word living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Look there. We can look through the prophetic center, which is Jesus Christ. All prophecy points to him and declares the salvation of God in him, the creation of world and the salvation of the world, in and through the same being, the person of Jesus Christ. We can look to the prophetic center, Jesus. We can seek him. I encourage you, any circumstances you face, submit and bow down to the lordship of Jesus Christ. If you seek him, in Christ lies the answer to the problems you face. And it may not be in the answer you necessarily want. You just don't really care anymore because you found peace in the person of Christ. We can look through prophecy, the spirit, gifts, I have watched God speak through other people. In my life, through my life, different things. In the Old Testament, God's spirit would come on people to do certain things. Like Jeremiah, the spirit of God would come on him and move on him for a season. 
and then it would kind of depart. And what do we know about the Christian age now? We know this, that the Spirit of God at Pentecost did not come on or around us anymore. This building is no more the church than like a brick is the Taj Mahal, you know? Like it's not. This isn't the church. You are. Why? Because the Spirit lives in you. The Spirit lives in you. Since the Spirit lives in us and we are the church, something new has happened. And what we know is this. The Spirit of God dwells in believers now. And since the Spirit lives in you, some of you have been given the gift of prophecy. And we'll talk more about it in weeks to come. But what we have to learn to do is listen. Listen. Oh, man, there's so much noise. So much noise. I won't, yeah, I will ask. By show of hands, who got AirPods for Christmas? Anybody? Oh, lies. No way. I have seen more new AirPods running around lately. Those little, they, like, it's, it's basically, you know, like your earbuds, but without the wire. For any, all the students are like, you're so old. Don't judge me. But it, the, the reality is, like, I see these little stumps hanging out of people's ear, you know, and, and you just look, they're totally disconnected. They're filled with all the white noise of whatever's going on, the podcasts, the music, and all these things. We have it all the time. I'm addicted to podcasts, to listening to books, to all this stuff. I don't like silence. Doing this has been hard for me. Listen. Listen, church, because there is a matter at hand. Jesus is still the matter at hand, and God is speaking about how you and I will live and declare him faithfully and fitfully in this world. So I call you into a season to listen and know that the prophetic spirit of God is still at work, wooing, moving, and speaking into the lives of people the matter that is closest to the heart of God. One of the best ways you can engage in listening, grab devotions on your way out, get into them and spend time in prayer. I would encourage you to spend time in prayer. Turn off the radio on your commute and just spend time praying or listening. Just quit talking and ride with God. Let him speak. Allow God the moments of silence where you just sit and tune your ear to him as we as a church begin to listen. Pray with me. God, thank you for who you are and the work you're doing in our lives. And I pray, God, that you would speak to us the matter at hand, that you would take, just as you said to Jeremiah, that you put the words, the matter that is closest to your heart, in his mouth, God, that you would put the matter that is closest to your heart into our hearts and that we would experience what you love. And then God, give us courage to obey and to live out this gospel that calls us not into a mundane religious order, but into a living, vibrant life that declares the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, give us the courage to listen, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope that you found today's teaching to be uplifting and encouraging, but also very challenging for you and your spiritual walk with Christ. If you're looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's teaching, make sure that you click the link below because that'll take you to our weekly devotions. And devotions are a vital part of what we do here at the Foundry Church. So be sure to do that. Thanks again for joining us and we cannot wait to see you again next week.